that's work in progress for in intrinsics. I think that's not out yet. Well, as long as you don't need anything other than that, I think that's fine. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, yeah, we're kind of working through intrinsics API inside sci fi, and we'll let that out at some point when it seems uh, reasonably self consistent and whatnot. Um, I don't think we have time for it. Plan is still not to do a vector ABI, uh, which may not be a good idea, but it's still a plan. Um, there's no real facility in the ISA for having an API to pass you know, vector, basically pass registers and vectors between functions, which uh, is something I think we should try to fix. Like we talked about this last talk. And it's kind of come in and out, so uh, I'm not sure what's going to happen there. But uh, I think, uh, at least from the SVE side of things, it looks like it is a bad decision to be missing that. Uh, I assume that's still the prevailing wisdom. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, hopefully we'll get that fixed. The ISA is pretty far from being uh, finalized, so there's some time to move stuff around. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I don't know if anyone else has anything. Vector session, yeah. Uh, when you say no ABI, are you, are you going to have any specs on whether these registers are implicitly corruptible by yeah. things like long jump? And so I guess no ABI yeah. means that like every function call destroys your entire vector state. Okay. Right. Um, so it's not. I guess it's not. There's no ABI, right? There's no vector specific ABI. Right. So you basically have to assume that there's no way to pass a, a state in vector registers either around a function call or into a function call. Or anything like that. Uh, the one benefit that you do have over um, over uh, SVE is that your vector register do not overlap your floating point register. Yeah, we went is, one way and then back the other way. So I, I like the no overlap version. So hopefully we'll stick with that. Um, but uh, you never know. Yeah, Bob, well, you may have mentioned because I can't, I can't, I missed the very first bit of this. Yeah, no problem. Um, the whole issue of runtime portability of compiled vector code, which I know the ARM guys have wrestled with, yeah. uh, to the extent of you know, having a, an extension to the C standard. Um, have you got an idea about how you want to go about that? So what do you mean by runtime portability? Like well, the actual generated binaries? Maybe? So if you've got a generated binary, if you run on whatever configuration or yeah. size you've got, um, which I think if I'm right for SVE, it's a bit of a challenge. We've got SVE, any SVE experts here? Yeah. Am I right that SVE is, you decide that different architectures may have different sizes and vectors. Correct. And it's a challenge if you compile code. In the no, you, okay. One you, you, you can force the compiler to assume a certain size, but that is neither recommended nor the default. It's there to, to make a couple of different algorithms easier to write for the purposes of the people who paid a lot of money to make this happen. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think Chris is going to be the same way. Right? Mm -hmm. it, 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 it is possible to write code that will not work with arbitrary vector lengths, but anything that comes out of the compiler should do so, and well behaved code should do so. Okay, I mean, but I, I mean, because the challenge always used to be that you had to then, if you like, have a left extra layer of direction, you carry it forward instantly. But I cannot make any assumptions about how long vectors are in my compiler. Yeah, I mean, so the ISA is, so there's kind of the ISA, and then what we might be actually be able to generate code for it, right? The, the ISA is designed such that you, know, you get portability between different implementations, at least correctness portability, not performance portability, of course, right? Um, uh, now, we still really don't know how we're going to generate code for that, no, so that's kind of up in the air. That was really yeah. my question. Was. Yeah. yeah, so I think um, I'd certainly be very upset if we started generating code that assumed a particular vector width. Uh, you know, you, that, that, would not, that would not be good. Um, now, it might be that for at least the early code gen, we do not use long application vector lengths, but you can still generate correct vector assembly from the compiler that use a short application vector lengths. You just won't get all the you know meat out of the vector unit. So that's probably going to be where we start with, because right? that's what most of the infrastructure looks like. Um, it's going to be a, a ways away before we have real long vector compilation stuff going on for people code. At least 
least that's my opinion. I don't know if anyone else is working on these kind of things before. Yeah, they, they ignore us. <laughs> Uh, it's kind of like we talked about last year, the vector extension is really quite different than SV, even if they both have potentially you know, lots of vector lengths. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of work that needs to go into that to get decent performance. Right now, on the sci fi side of things, we're really focused on you know, hand programmed libraries and C intrinsics and whatnot. Um, if everybody gets stuff like running, uh, that's kind of where you're starting these things. Um, okay, I don't know if there's any other vector extension stuff you guys want to talk through. Okay, Bitmanip extension, which is the B extension. This is another one that's a draft. Uh, out of three patches for mini tools, largely being done by the Bitmanip working group. And then you have a little bit of quick and stuff. Yeah, and Maxine has big plugs about patches. Okay. That doesn't actually work. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> um, cool, yeah, so I think. Uh, for this one, there's some stuff that's easy to target, and that's kind of what having a fruit we're going after for now, and the rest of it's intrinsic stuff. So. It's so worth pointing out the B extension has rather flagged up the issue of how you decide what the command line option yeah. is to say what architecture you are. <laughs> yeah, one I see. The maximum that half the time is spent on this has been navigating the how we're actually going to pass options in because there are now so many extensions. Because it isn't just a B extension. <laughs> It's a big extension with about 27 different, uh, exactly, yeah. a lot of different variants. Yeah. And you end up with an architecture string that goes off the end of the page. And <laughs> some of those, like, some of those variants are small to implemented hardware and very interesting for things that don't want the rest of the B extension. So we're going to have to tackle that. Um, but it, it is a block on things progressing upstream in the compiler until it's an agreement on what the command line is going to be to name your architecture. And I think we're at the level, are we not now, where we're going to have an option to say whether you're going to specify the architecture in the old fashioned way or the new way. So you actually need two options. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Have you yeah. been through that before? And it's it's with, uh, oh. it. Sorry. This extension made me think of the GCC bug that's requesting an architecture independent built in for bit reverse. And that seems to be one of the things that this extension does. So are things like that architecture independent intrinsics on your neighbor. So that's GCC bug 50481 built in to reverse the bit order. Because okay. that's something that some other architectures have as well. Yeah. Maybe not quite such a general reversing instruction as this five, but. I mean, that seems like, to me, a reasonable you know, GCC built-in as opposed to an architecture yeah, so, built-in. Yes, yeah, so it's possible there are other things in this extension that should have architecture and yeah, yeah, so This particular one has a bug that was filed in 2011 asking for it, or with a comment saying what can I call those built-in, so presumably you want to give them the same name. Yeah, so we're trying really hard in RISC-5 land to make sure that everything is the same between the LVM stuff and RISC-5 stuff. Yes, so but when you do the extension stuff, you might want them to look at GCC yeah. bug. Right. You want to just uh, send an email so it, I don't well, lose it. I might add a comment to this bug in yeah, like the same. It yeah. applies to this five big yeah. extension. Cool. There's like a hundred percent chance I will forget the bug number. <laughs> yes, <laughs> well, if one of the miss five people is watching bugs in and they add a comment. Joseph, just turn around and say it very clearly into the microphone. Watch the camera up to the hold your phone up to the camera there. Yeah. The yeah. Uh, I was just gonna say, having been through this one. Oh, it's not off. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> Remember the password? No. One, two, there you go. One, two, three, four. Q, W, B, R. Q, W, B, R. It's focusing. And there we go. Awesome. Uh, let's see. Having been through this there. on a uh, GCC port that had two to the twelfth combinations of, of permutations, I'm certainly willing to share my experiences with that problem. Offline. Yeah. I mean. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to do with them. I say string stuff. That feels like something that needs to be argued about on the mailing list. So. Yeah. Well, this is a good forum, actually, to try and get some resolution. Yeah, so I mean, when you've got to your slides, we might actually go into that. Now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because, yeah. because yeah. then we can say. I mean, we don't have to get the goal is not necessarily to get through the slides. I mean, my opinion on the ISA string part of stuff is we just did the simple version and just hard as ISA strings as the current ISA treats them and avoid all the old versions. But uh, that's not the real opinion. So. <laughs> Moving on, uh, sixty-four bit time T. Um, yeah, I I have not been working on it. Alistair says that he's going to finish it. He's pretty adamant about that. Uh, so with any luck, we will get it done. 
um, it kind of nominally targeting the next two releases we've been doing for the last two years. So <laughs> this time for real, hopefully. I don't know if anything has anything. Anyone has anything specific to talk about? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, large code model. So this is something that started to come up for us recently. Uh, we have Meta and Emedlo. They're both effectively two big ranges on RB64. Uh, we have a lot of embedded targets that have sparse memory regions. People want to put stuff all over them. It doesn't work in two weeks, um, especially in the big systems. Um, so we've had a bunch of discussions internally. Kind of first thing to think is how many bits, right? 43 is the next one up. You know, it's one, one, one more instruction, but it's kind of the odd man out when you look at the patterns in terms of what uh, relocations you use. Um, the other option here is just to jump to 64 bit relax stuff, which I don't really know if I want to bite the bullet on that much more linker relaxation. So I'm not sure which is the better answer here. Um, we're leaning towards inlines instead of constant pools. Uh, for the smaller ones, the inline stuff is the same number of instructions, and doing all the constant pool you know, deleting is uh, a lot of work. So I don't know if anyone has opinions. Anything to talk about large code model lands? Well, on power, we we have small, medium, and large. Yeah, um, so we don't have small because we use linker relaxation to go yeah. from medium to small. So we threw that one out. Yeah. Um, I kind of, yeah, so basically you look at this and it's like you do 43 and then you end up with something like 50, 52, something like that, and then 64. I don't want to have that many code models. Yeah. Um, 43 is nice because it's one extra instruction. Um, the problem is that we have some systems that are bigger than 43 bits in the embedded space and there's stuff all over the place. And when you look at, say, like relaxing from 64 downward, 43 doesn't really fit because I, I have all the patterns listed on my website. But the, you know, it's like you do the add at the end instead of the middle or something like that, right? So uh, just got kind of doesn't line up and it makes it a headache. Um, so what we might end up with is kind of a <laughs> we ended up with a you know 43 and then a 64 or something like that. Um, yeah, I, I don't know the right answer. Just from the systems I've seen, is if you're doing sparse address spaces, you're typically using the whole 64 bits. So I suspect. I mean, I, I, we're I, not. Well, we don't have anything that's more than 50 bits, but that, you know. Well, it, I mean, okay. Um, I've I've seen systems not not just on it where if you go from there, in embedded architecture, and you're going for 64 bit embedded as opposed to 32 bit, but any of these things. Once you've gone for sparse memory, you've got different memory blocks everywhere. For all sorts of arbitrary design decisions, you may plonk those block bits anywhere in the address space range. Yeah, I mean, there is some hardware cost to increasing the physical address space, which is why we tend to, Yeah. but we get like a, you know, one more bit of physical address space every two months or something on aggregate inside inside of so. You know, if we're at 50 now, then doing 53 is probably not a wise decision. Uh, so um, I think the real question here is basically, do, do we do 43 or do we just skip it? <laughs> um, I don't know. But I think, I, I mean, I, I would be in favor of doing this once and fixing it. It does mean that it's going to be a lot more work, particularly if you want to get reasonable performance out of this large code model stuff. But the nice thing about doing 64 is that it's the physical address with the ISA and then we're done with it forever. Aside from, you know, like relaxations. One thing for us though is on the sixty-four bit side, we prefer large code code model or code model. Yeah, it's a lot slower for us. Yeah. So we don't default to that. We default to the medium code model. And, and so, do you yeah. relax from large to medium? I'd have to ask Alan. Yeah. Alan is the expert on the, the whole linker thing. Uh, I think we do. I think he's got some optimizations on there, but then you're left with. When you relax at the length time, you can't get rid of those instructions. So then you just no ops. Uh, we actually delete them when we relax. You can delete them at length time? Yes. Okay. Look at, here we go. It's on here. There we go. We delete everything. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, so this has been on the to list for a while. So right now we delete all of our no opt out. And so we go through, we relax them, we turn them to no ops and our RSP none. And then we shift the ball back up, making our link time uh, n squared. So you have to relink or relocate uh, all the others? Yeah, and, and we, we shift, like, every, every time we drop an instruction, we shift every byte after that back up. 
which makes blinking large programs really slow. Right? So when we do the PC relative stuff, because with the PC relative relaxations, they end up aliasing if you start to shift everything up. So for that, what we do is we don't convert them to none, we convert them to an internal bin utils relocation called delete. Right? We then keep that around until the end when we're done fixing up all the relocations, we keep track of all the offsets that get changed and whatnot. Then we go through, so we have a third pass to uh, the, the re uh, relocation uh, thing, whatever that function is called in bin utils. Then that goes and deletes them all uh, later. If, that's what, if you're gonna do that, couldn't you just Default to the smaller one, and then if need to, add it, add space. No, because okay. <laughs> you can't yeah. do the opposite. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Okay. it's it's we found it much easier to like you you kind of need an invariant, so you need to either always be getting smaller or always keep it getting bigger. Otherwise, it does not necessarily uh, converge. Okay, right. So we decided to always be getting smaller, okay. um, and we bend over backwards for alignment to ensure that, um, which we screwed up a couple times. Um, but that it should work now. Uh, so yeah, that that is how we handle that, and it is a you know huge pile of complexity in the linker. And you need that extra space, so no opting is a you, you want to. Well, so we have single issue in order processors, which means that no ops oh. versus integer ops don't really make a difference, okay. right? <laughs> um, and then additionally, we have a bunch of embedded users who care about cosets, right? Uh, so yeah, we, I mean, you know, strictly needed. We have big machines, and we wouldn't care, right? You're, you're doing power stuff, right? Yeah. Yeah. So our no ops are all yeah. the dispatch. The the dispatcher throws them out. Yeah. So yeah. They never make the, the no op accelerator. Which is great, but we don't. So uh, we actually do have a little bit of one in the the front end, which will throw out some compressed ops, but uh, not a whole lot else because um, we're not fetching enough. Yeah. To fill that. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, so it's a kind of a distraction. I forget where we are now. Okay. Yeah. Back in code model. So. Um, but yes, so the I think the idea there would be to go relax everything away and delete, which is a lot of work. I mean, it's already a ton of work to do the relaxations as they stand, and deleting more stuff is even more work. Um, so I don't know what the right answer is there. So do you do you when you relax? When you see something that you can relax, do you immediately go compress everything and then continue, or can you maybe? Assemble everything once, find out what got relaxed, and then yeah. try to. Well, that's basically the R risk delete. Okay. Right. So, how how we have two type we so <laughs> we have the old relaxations that happened before we realized that you could do PC relative relaxation <laughs> in that manner, and then we have the PC relative stuff. Right. So for the old ones, as soon as we see one, we delete it, turn the relocation into uh, a none relocation, and then we shift everybody up. And as a result, we don't need to keep additional bookkeeping in the linker because everything is just where it is, right? Uh, but then you have n squared, right? Because you should everything up all the time, it makes linking big programs super slow. And for the PC relative stuff, you can get aliasing because everything's PC relative in the middle and then you don't know who your target is. How our PC relative stuff works is that the load, we have a PC relative instruction and then a load instruction that's register based. So you point the load to the PC relative instruction and that tells you what the actual address is. So if you start deleting stuff in the middle, then your load can point to the wrong piece of relative instruction and you get the wrong pulse. Uh, so is the delete, sorry. Is it, is, it, is it really worth going through all of that uh, by the complicated relaxation? Is it possible to just go ahead and add yet another extension to get 48 bit and or 64 bit? Add uh, PC. Yeah, I mean, so that so that you so that you, you, you now have either sixty four, forty eight, or thirty two bit. Add yeah, it's a it's a PC. sensible question. And then and now your pointer is so much easier. Yeah, it's a that. it's a sensible question. I think the issue there is that we would still be at the assembler emitting the large instruction and then yes. compressing it. Right. But, but it would now, make it, now your cases are down to instead of recognizing a whole sequence yeah. of instructions, you've got one instruction yeah, it makes it easier. into one other instruction. Yeah, yeah, it makes it a lot easier because you don't have to chase around the uh, PC chains and whatnot. Right. Um, and if, if if we're talking embedded systems like it seems like you might have more control over exactly which I am saying. So the problem with that 
making them actually PC relative is that a lot of the stuff won't fit into a PC relative window. Right? It, 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 you know, it doesn't buy you that much because they're putting stuff all over the place and their code is going just their data. Right? So apps would have to be absolute, right? which means that we need basically a 64-bit instruction, which some of the smaller cores are going to be grumpy about. Yeah. Or, or you just, you only need a, a 48-bit constant that you can adjust with final uh, add or load. Also. Yeah. So we need, I, we need like a 64-bit instruction with a 48-bit constant in it, yeah. um, which would give us a 48-bit code model. It's still not big enough for all of our no, systems. Because it could be shifted. The 48-bit shifted ah, constant okay. that you add the low 16 bits to. Right, yeah, low 12 bits. But yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, then we could probably whack that into a 48-bit instruction, which doesn't help us on the small cores because they're all 32-bit fronts. Um, but that's a sensible discussion to have. And it would certainly make it would certainly fit way better into how we're currently doing relaxations, right? Because it basically just be a bigger, uh, well, a bigger Louis. Um, okay, yeah, that's a good idea. I will see if I can this size, I guess. Okay, uh, anything else? Constant cool stuff. I think we're kind of moving away from that. Everyone's okay with it? <laughs> Nobody would like it. <laughs> cool. Um, all right, so core mark. Uh, we're not allowed to do the signed UNT32 anymore. Uh, so, does everyone know this? Okay, so you you guys know Cormark, right? So there's Matt Mull in Cormark. Matt Mull uses a UNT32 to do the index into the array. Uh, we keep everything signed, extended, and registers, and that means that because it's a UNT32, when you do all multiplies and whatnot, you have to keep all that stuff unsigned, so you have to go truncate it to high bits in case you had n, which is their you know, the max index big enough that it would overflow the 32-bit number, which doesn't happen. So we speed up core arc by just telling the, the whatever headers that the un32 type in core mark is assigned to integer, right? which is obviously not the right thing to do. And they have officially banned it as of a few months ago. Um, so we got to go figure something else out. Uh, one can envision writing a complicated compiler optimization pass that would <laughs> fix that for you. Um, well, the B extension has instructions that help. Help, but don't fix, right? Because we right. still, it, 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 and this, the problem is that this loop, right, being a integer three nested loop, loops, that map all, the inner loop where you're doing all this stuff is like four or five instructions or something. There's a bunch of analysis on the mm -hmm. website. So adding one instruction in there destroys, destroys your car market performance, right? It's one instruction better than two instructions. <laughs> Right, uh, but we we still we don't have the ARM stuff where we do the you know, you know shift and index and whatnot in the in the load instructions. Um, so I can't come up with a better way to fix it than something horribly complicated that only applies to Cormac. Um, I thought I'd bring it up in case anyone is really excited about <laughs> weird compiler uh, passes. Um, okay, all right. Well, it's something we'll have to fix at some point. Um, Okay, the PC relative multi word relocation. So Jim found the bug here about like six months ago or something. Remember? Over a year ago. Over a year ago. <laughs> okay, uh, yeah, so our PC relative <laughs> relocations can only get to a single symbol because um, otherwise they start to overflow in the middle uh, in a way that you can't really describe to a user, right? Depends on where you want to go and whatnot. Um, that means we can't use section anchors uh, in PC relative modes. Um, it also not only means that right, you, you don't have a lot of multi-word symbols in most things. Um, if you were to do piece relative code on RV32, you'd end up with a handful of for the 64-bit stuff. But the non-PC relative uh, code model covers the entire address space in RV32, so we're basically safe there. Um, kind of senseless to use the piece relative one. Um, but uh, the theory here is that section anchors would give us appreciably better code sets. Um, haven't really yet been able to figure a way out of this one. But there's options for adding in basically another instruction in the middle there that we relax away when it overflows, which doesn't happen all the time. It's only a, a once every 12 bits, effectively. Um, but then that's more relaxation. And it's a hard one to do because the feature relative stuff is all uh, tricky in that regard. You might talk to uh, Mike Meissner. He's adding PC relative now for power. Okay. And we, I know on power, 
pre-PC relative, we do use section anchors. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if he's disabled that or he's found some way to... All right, I'll work. work. Plug in and see what he's doing. Do you happen to know how you're... Uh, it's probably not relevant forever, but we can talk about it later. Um, yeah, that's currently a bit of a thorn in the side. Uh, we're getting more into the weeds of the tool chain stuff here, so you guys have stuff you want to talk about here, welcome to bring it up. I don't know how much time we have left. So this is more of a... Uh, risk five specific problem that we have two by construction alignment and we know the target can be four by the line but the instruction may be two by the line so when you take the pc relative offset you may get a, a value that's mod two and not mod four and then when you try adding offsets you can get unexpected overflows this would have been fixed if the thing had been page aligned yeah, and that's effectively what the third instruction would do. It's just align the PC relative. Right? Well, if 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 you were to if you were to add those slightly larger, um, you can them aligned. You make them aligned. Yeah, and you fix this problem once and for all. Yeah. <laughs> you, keep, <laughs> yeah, yeah. you keep convincing me to add new instructions. <laughs> we promise we still have a bunch of junk out there that we need to fix it for, but that does seem like a uh, convenient way to handle this. So you're saying your PC relative instructions have to be more aligned than normal instructions? Um, well, we have this compressed extension that allows two byte alignment of instructions. So our, we have a four byte instruction that the OE PC that computes the PC relative offset. But because it can be two byte aligned, that means when we compute the PC relative offset, we may get a number that ends in two. Okay. Yeah. And then when you try to add an offset to that, it may overflow. We can't be sure that the uh, adding, you would think that, okay, suppose you have a, a long long, it's eight byte aligned, and then you generate this PC relative offset, but the PC relative offset may have a two at the end. And you add a four byte, which normally it should be okay to add a four byte offset because you know the target address is eight byte line. Mm -hmm. But because we have this unaligned OEPC instruction, adding the four may overflow and that prevents it from working. Yeah, you can always get to one, you just can't get to the second one. Yeah, well, right. it works for one variable. Yeah. It doesn't work for two variables or for multi, yeah, multi word variables. Yeah, cool. So that's the problem. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I, we I don't have that problem um, for our new PC relative struct. We have these prefix instructions, but they can all be at four byte alignment, just like the normal yeah. instructions. But yeah, if we force yeah. the LEPC to be four byte aligned, that fixes the problem. But then it increases code size because now we have these extra yeah. Like numbers. Yeah. Well, well, as part of ours, we we our instructions could be four byte aligned, but then they can't cross like a 64 byte boundary or something like that. And we don't want the user to have to put these alignments directives to, to do that. So we, I've added code to the assembler then that will go and if it sees some of, the, some of these special instructions crossing one of these boundaries, I'll put an OOP, insert an OOP to get it on a nice alignment. For, for some of those uses, but so most of, most of them never have to do that. But yeah, the problem is that we would we'll end up at a like the the it has to be aligned to the same as the symbol size, which is usually small enough that those no ops would just kill you. And you don't have another two byte align. We do instruction that you could shift to to move the one instead of aligning. Yeah, but the, so I mean we we could align all so basically we could align all of the. Our PC is which are the PC yeah. relative instruction to the symbol size, but then you're putting in a lot of those numbers, yes. okay. right? And that is effectively the same as putting the AND after the Howie PC that just aligns the output of the Howie PC, because we have a two byte AND instruction as well. So it's kind of the same thing. Either way, we would have to find some way to delete the instructions that are not used, because most of the time you're not, you don't care, you don't have the multi right. uh, symbol stuff. Um, now, when you pull out section anchors, you get a ton of it. Right? But without section anchors, you don't get a whole lot. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, that that that, I get that that wrinkle with the our PC being a different instruction is a very first five wrinkle. Um, but yeah, an aligned out an aligned out PC instruction. Right? Um, 
Okay. Uh, Zijen, we shall talk. I don't know if anyone has anything to talk about. <coughs> just to check in the room, people are comfortable with the decision of just to focus on the simulator and not to try and push brand new assembly. Yeah, I mean, I, I'm of the don't fix things that aren't broken, you know. <laughs> uh, and now at some point it would make sense to flip the assembler over when we end up with a big pile of new stuff, but we have the hand done assembler for B and V, so. I, I've done it both ways, and I think I've done the assemblers. The assemblers tend to be easier sometimes. Okay. And, and more reliable. Okay. I've, I mean, in QMU land, we did the machine generated assembler, which I thought was a lot easier, but also I didn't do it. So <laughs> there, there's, <laughs> all, there's also a problem <laughs> if, you, if you machine generate both the assembler and the disassembler, you could have consistent errors between the two. Yeah. That you don't pick out if one of them isn't done with a different set of inputs. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, if you do it twice, then you just have errors in one of them, and there's still errors. You get consistent errors like you do it by hand. If you misunderstand the theme, yeah. it's not if the same like person does it, you can easily True. get consistent yes. errors. <laughs> so I, I, I've had a few instances of that where I make consistent mistakes. Yeah. So you see success for you tell us about yeah, it. Yeah, we are. It, it, and I will add that I, we once did a CGen generated GCC description too. I don't recommend it, but it is possible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that seems like. Possibly a good idea. <laughs> okay. Um, all right. Uh, our risk to delete stuff, I guess we kind of brought this up a little bit before. Um, it's one of those things that's been on my thorn on my side for a while. Uh, probably won't fix it until we do meaningfully complicated uh, linker representation, um, which may come out of some of the code and all stuff, or may come out of outline. Um, okay. Uh, now we're really getting into the small stuff. Uh, we don't have inline sequences for quite and half atomics. Uh, not the most exciting of things, but the district guys complain about needing low atomic all over the place. Um, yeah, kind of just a headache. Uh, David keeps complaining about it. Uh, putting L atomic in. Sorry. You're si is the issue that people need to put in L atomic manually? Yes. We, somewhere there's a DCC bug, I don't remember the number, saying that it ought to be included automatically with as needed in a link aspect. So, so there's a small argument that it's an architecturally dependent DCC issue with the specs. So the spec we, we include it anywhere there's P thread. We don't include it anywhere there's LP thread, which usually works well, even if not. The right. argument is since it's just the C language feature, it should be included with as needed in the default specs. So that is what I suggested yeah. to the district guys that we should yeah. just do that. And they said, if the GCC people are okay with it, then we're okay with it. My so. view is that's what we should do. There is an open bug somewhere saying we should do it. Yeah, right. why are you I just for this? Because we don't have instructions to do bytes and half so, atomics. And it would no doubt complicate a bit the GCC <laughs> test suite because it would mean that all of the GCC yeah. test suite would need to know how that's, to sign that, the that's what the, basically. I, I think we'll just need a Test case that fades for a major, a, a larger major architecture. My view is it should be done. It should be generally done regardless of architecture. Just automatically linking libatomic inside as needed whenever linking your plural yeah. or whatever. There's also another, another issue that says uh, having inlining some atomics and using locks for other atomics causes problems. Exactly. So, so we don't have use, to fix this anyway. We don't use locks in libatomic. Yes, we do. Yes. Well, in, I guess in any of the instructions that we, uh, any of the things that we would LRSC, we don't use locks for them in the load atomic version. We have LRSC spin things in there. We basically leave it the same code that we would in line in the call. Right? So we're safe from that. I mean, I don't know if there are other issues. Um, but the move, moving things from load atomic to inline would not change. <laughs> That makes sense. Okay, so okay, great. Maybe the right, I just, can you just ping me on the bug and uh, see if we can get it done? Because that would make life a little bit simpler. Uh, multi loop stuff. This is another usability headache. So we have a lot of MRH and ABI pairs, and some of them don't have a multi loop that is sane for them. So you get Incompatible default library. We should just go 
fix that. It might require adding a couple of new multi lib pairs, and then it will add, require adding a lot of reuses, um, which is a bit ugly. But uh, well, we've actually done that for side by releases. We haven't done it for all of them, <laughs> right? We've added a bunch, but we haven't actually generated all of the reuses, uh, right? I think we have. It's a little bit Okay. In the nineteen oh eight release, that had. Okay, I thought we just had full coverage of the things that we can generate from the designer thing. Um, but either way, I think we should have it in you know, upstream, so I don't want it. It's a headache for everybody. Well, it's also a headache for random people to download a tool chain and have to build a couple hundred multi -lips. No, but this wouldn't actually, this would only be like two or three more multi -lips. It would be mostly reuse patterns. Oh, mostly reuse. Yeah. yeah. The issue is we don't have I mean, I forget which ones we don't have, but it's like maybe uh, like some of the, like I think we don't have a 64F in the default library set. Right, so we, we would have to add like, you know, RB64IF and then LP64F or something like that. I think maybe we're also missing some well, I don't think you can fix this with a few reuses. I think you need a little more combination. Okay. Because when the API changes the reuse, yeah, it, I think we only need like maybe two or three more actual multi lips and then a lot of more reuses, like a thousand reuses. Yes. Not considering the vector extension, the yes, etc. Yeah, so we would then need, I guess, many thousand of them when we start to get more instructions, uh, uh, IS extensions. Um, so I don't know if uh, that's insane or it's just not worth fixing. Right now, what ends up happening is that you know we get all these people submitting bugs that are basically. I asked for a library set that is, or I, I asked for a multi lib that is not giving me the same thing. So it defaults to you know sixty four GC LP sixty four D when you pass you know, LP sixty four F, and then you get some linker error message that's kind of screwed. Uh, I think R must the same problem, so maybe I will discuss with them how they. Are. Okay. Yeah, I will bring up some more guests. Um, okay, uh, I think that's the extent of what I have. Uh, I don't know if there's any other response stuff people want to bring up. <laughs> there are still 20 minutes left. So. Yeah. <laughs> so there's something I would like to bring. Uh, this is something I mentioned to you and Jim already. And I'd like to take this opportunity to, to, to see if there's interest in that in the wider audience. The issue is, is um, uh, we have, we've been missing a certain feature that is very useful in, in my opinion in, uh, for debugging scenarios in a hosted environment like in running Linux user land. And that is the lack of uh, hardware stepping and uh, hardware breakpoints, uh, instruction breakpoints, and especially data breakpoints. This is something that would have to be taken with the architecture people, the, the DeFi group, I've been told. Uh, however, the question is whether we really want to have those features. So you, I mean, whether it's just me who, 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 who's. Uh, and you mean of, uh, hard hardware watch points for like Linux type systems? Yes, I mean, you know, yeah. it's essentially a debug type trap, yeah. hardware trap that uh, calls into the supervisor mode yeah. rather than the debug mode. Yeah, because we have it for basically bare metal debugging, but we don't have it yeah, for Yeah, so, so, so there was, uh, yeah. there was you know, the sort of base infrastructure in the hardware already. Yeah. So the question is whether we want to have a CSR, essentially interface, to like conditionalize that and tell the, the uh, tell the how the, the debug unit to trap into the kernel yeah. mode rather yeah. than the, the debug mode. Presumably, it should just be a new p trace function um, that will require a specific p trace entry point where you can set ask for a hardware breakpoint, and then I guess you need open SPI support to actually set the p trace. Yeah, uh, well, and we need an ISA extension to make it available a mode of debug mode. That's really the yeah. The problem is we don't have it in hardware. I yeah. mean, you know, we do have hardware. You can so not making set a, making there. a kernel interface for that will be just you know straightforward. Yeah, yeah. So, I just have that. So they're all like the triggers are all debug mode triggers, which you cannot yeah. set from anything but debug mode. Well, not even from 
I believe you oh, cannot. Well, that's the problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So the spec is kind of mechanical at that point. Um, yeah, I think everyone's in favor of it. It's just a <laughs> matter of doing okay. it. Yeah. The lipotomic thing is GCC bug eight one three five. So now there's like by the way. a two hundred percent chance on that. Yes, so <laughs> <laughs> it's eight one three five eight for the notes at the bottom. Yeah, hopefully you got picked up in the camera. <laughs> cool. Right. Eight one three five eight. Yeah, I mean, if it's saying to Adam everywhere, or at least ever refers five steps on. Yeah. Oh, if they're just because I, I, I'm not directly involved, but I see this thing going round and round. If there are no other topics to discuss, it would be quite good to use this route to nail a final decision on how the architecture should be specific substituted. Oh, because, yeah. like, as far as I can see, there is a never-ending mailing list. Is that fair to say? A long mailing yeah. list discussion going on, and no resolution. All right. Well, we have 15 minutes, so it's decided by the end of the. Talk. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You also yeah. need coordination with LLVM. Fair. But, but I think maybe we can at least come to a decision. So I think if, if, if the GNU community had a view, um, I mean, do you want, are you familiar with the issue, Jim? Yeah, it's complicated. Would you try and explain it or something? Well, um, I didn't know there was going to be a quiz. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't looked at it in a while. Uh, well, I can ask Maxim because he's been looking. Well, basically, in risk five, you've got uh, RB that's to IMC and so forth, and you've got some uh, support for if you want to have like snap. Well, in, in the old one, you could do something like RB that's to IMC, so and so, then you would do X, X foo, and that would be like a non standard extension. Uh, now they've changed the, sta uh, the standard to be you've got now RB32, so and so. And now you've got, um, there's S prefix subset, which is the standard supervisor, SX, which is the non-standard supervisor, Z, which is standard extension, of sta uh, standard arbitrary extension, and X, which is non-standard arbitrary extension. And you, there's version numbers, they, they have version numbers, and they have to be in a particular order, and it ends up being really difficult. So one thing they did was they switched the order. Oh of yeah, at least yeah, and X, where one came. Yeah, yeah. So the old style one came first, and the new style the other one comes first. So depending on your architecture version, you need a different ordering of the uh, yeah. extensions. So I think three. that's okay because we never we don't have any of those in any of the tools. Yeah, that's what Andrew yeah. Larvin told me. There are no existing S extensions, so presu <laughs> presumably we could just ignore that problem and just assume that we've never just pretend that we've never supported the old. S extension. We have never split the old S extension. So I think and we're doing S X was dropped. S X is valid in old strings but not valid in new strings. And again we never had any. We never had those, any, so we can just so. pretend they never existed. To me the real question is the version number stuff. Right? Do we include the version number and continue parsing things as old to continue allowing people to parse things as old ISA strings, or we just do we just move to the new version? And I would if they were just moving to the new version. Well, no, the version numbers have always defaulted to like 2.0 everywhere. And if you, if the, when a linker looks, you've got two object files, and if the version number is like, it's just instant failed. So it, it errors out. So no one uses, the version numbers aren't used anywhere. So. And should the linker error out if you've got different versions? Well, I anticipate the reason they were put there is that there are some cases where it shouldn't error out. Like if you've got, well, that, yeah, like an integer version 2.2 and integer version 2.1. I don't know if you know what the difference between them is. Uh, fence and I and Oh, yeah, right. Yeah. What about 2.1 and 2.0? So, uh, I don't know about those two. Yeah, they're 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 yeah, the CSR stuff got pulled out at some point, too. So, I, I mean, I think it's another one of those things where practically it doesn't matter because all that stuff got banned from the Linux API. Anyway, there are no CSRs in user space, and there's <coughs> fence.i is banned from user space as well. So we did that before the ISA did it. So I think we can just move to it and say, yeah, if you have embedded binaries, then you'll have to recompile your code, but that's OK for embedded stuff. We you know, slow around. That, 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 that's a false assumption. 
if you've had your binary carefully signed off, signed off for cryptographic security. I tell you, the smart card people, oh, just recompile your binary, it gets them really, really upset. Okay. Okay, so I think that we actually have to deal with that case of, okay. for all people, recompile your program should not generally be an option. Okay. To so then we just need to have the version string, the version number parsing in the ISA string. Yeah. It's complexity, but... We already have version number parsing. It's already in there. And well, I guess we have to obey yeah. it. Yes. Yeah. Right. The issue is what exactly does G mean if you don't specify the version number or... Yeah. So I think there we should always have the default one point to the newest ISA, right? As whenever the compiler is you know, released. And if people want explicit compatibility with the older versions, then they enumerate that in the ISA string. So that would mean if I wanted to get what I had already, I would have to use something different to what I used for which If you want to get something that's never going to change, then you have to use the explicit version. The but but version. suppose I compiled my smart card application, got it certified last year. Um, I have to actually do something different this year to get the same thing. You have to use different compiler arguments. Or we'll use the same compiler you used last yeah. year. Yeah, okay, that's a fair yeah. point. Yeah, 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 yeah. you probably want to say goodbye. No, okay, yeah. Uh, I mean, I think if you're going to upgrade your compiler, then upgrading or changing your compiler arguments is, right? I'd be way more worried about the compiler than the arguments. Okay. Right? Okay. Mm. Yeah. Okay, so that seems weird. So we have a solution. Yeah. So it might be good if Max and Jim perhaps could post to the mail and just say, having had this discussion. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the last time I had to deal with it, having that kind of embedded guarantees. We checked the entire tool chain into source control with the sources to guarantee that it would produce exactly the same output. That was the only way yeah. that we could. And that's why I wasn't worried about there. the recompile your binary stuff, because you're probably going to do that if you upgrade your compiler. Yeah. So I think just assuming that embedded people are willing to recompile is probably dead. But I think well, we've got a solution yeah. anyway that works. So. Yeah. And you know, the, the, the version numbers are in the ISA string, and then they disambiguate all this stuff. So. At least allowing people to you know, get get what they're asking for seems reasonable, even if it is a little more headache. Um, you know, right now it's only CSRs and that's I and G might move around a little bit too. Oh. Yeah, there's nothing else left okay. on the screen. Now. Okay, we'll, we can get that written up, and then yeah. we've got about a month until the end of the end dev meeting, okay. and we can at least put a round table up in short notice yeah. to get anyone who cares about that to come and look from the LLVM and try and do it. I'm just conscious of just seeing this sync of developer effort <coughs> going into this problem. But this is not where you want compiler brains going. Yeah. But I think, uh, yeah, I think, yeah, this is the reasonable way to go about it. Um, sorry, I haven't been paying attention to the mail posts, so I don't know what the other opinions are. OK, uh, yeah, anything else? That was faster than I expected. <laughs> First thing that was good. All right, cool. Thanks, guys. Thanks, Mike.